good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So, my name is Wataru Shimizu uh, from Nippon Medical School, Tokyo, Japan. I'm currently deputy editor uh, of Jack Asia. I will chair uh, this uh, webinar uh, together with uh, Professor Milong Chen from China. Uh, first of all, it is my great pleasure and privilege to give an opening speech uh, for this webinar. Asia Cryo Live 2022 endorsed by Jack Asia. Uh, cryoablation has already become very popular worldwide. The total number of AFib patients who underwent cryoablation uh, has reached a million cases in the world. In Japan, probably in the world, uh, cryoablation of AF accounts for uh, approximately 20% of all AFib patients who received the catheter ablation. Uh, the, indication, the indication of cryoablation has also expanded from paroxysmal AF uh, to persistent AF. In today's uh, webinar, we asked four distinguished doctors from the United States, Canada and Japan uh, to give uh, keynote lectures after the keynote lectures, a uh, cryoablation case will be presented by two doctors from Canada and Japan. Panel discussion will be scheduled after the case presentation, uh, which will be moderated by Professor Milo Chan. It is our sincere hope uh, that the audience will enjoy this webinar and advance uh, their knowledge of cryoablation. Uh, next, uh, on behalf of Professor uh, Wan, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Jack Asia, I would like to introduce uh, Jack Asia uh, using my slide. So I will share uh, the slide. Can, can you see the slide? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so I will introduce uh, Jack Asia. Uh, Jack Asia uh, have kicked off with a great start uh, since uh, February uh, last year, uh, 2021. Uh, Jack Asia uh, is a fully uh, open access journal and was quarterly pub published in 2021. And it has transferred to bi monthly publication uh, this year to in 2022. Uh, the topics uh, ranges range from cardiovascular health and prevention to late stage interventions uh, focused on Asian populations. Uh, this is number of submission. Uh, the last year, uh, 327 manuscripts were submitted in uh, 11 months uh, in 2021 uh, from January to December. Uh, authors submitted uh, from uh, 29 countries, regions, and the uh, following uh, regions uh, contributed uh, Seventy-seven percent of the submission. The number one is mainland China, uh, seventy-nine uh, papers. Uh, next, Japan, uh, seventy-seven papers, and South Korea, United States, India, and Singapore, and so on. Uh, Eighty-seven percent of the submissions were original research and state-of-the-art reviews. Uh, Two hundred twenty-six papers, uh, account for accounting for seventy-seven percent, uh, was uh, original research papers, and ten percent uh, was uh, state-of-the-art reviews, including the invited uh, state-of-the-art review. Eighty percent of the manuscripts are on these uh, nine topics. And the number one is coronary, uh, peripheral, and structural interventions, and the next uh, health promotion, uh, prevention, cardiologies. And today's webinar is uh, uh, is for uh, cryoablation of AFib. Uh, 
uh, about approximately 7% uh, of their uh, uh, accepted papers uh, on regarding on uh, rhythm disorder and electrophysiology, uh, 22 papers. Uh, this is the uh, acceptance rate. Uh, uh, 15.21% uh, of manuscripts were accepted by the end of 2021. And the acceptance rate of original research uh, was 13.87%, was, uh, and that of reviews, 25.71%. So what is Jack Asia looking for? Uh, we are looking for original research, cutting edge te technology, uh, and clinical recommendations, and cross uh, disciplinary studies where Asian researchers hold a competitive edge and comparative studies between Asia and the rest of the world. The novelty, uh, quality, ethnics, and clinical relevance are uh, important uh, for the acceptance of Jack Asia. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we would like to start uh, the keynote uh, speech by the four uh, presenters. So uh, let me introduce the first speaker, uh, the Dr. Wilbur Su uh, from the United States. And the title of his talk is uh, Current Status and uh, Prospect of Cryocatheter Abrasion of Atrial Fibration. And Dr. Su, please. Could you share the slide? There we go. Thank you very much. And it's always an honor to be here along with my colleagues to discuss the topics that uh, we love. So I was given the, the task of um, updating the current status and prospect of cryocatheter ablation for AFib. So I think to help set up the topic for everybody, of course, you know, when we talk about catheter ablation, you know, these are the topics that we often are looking for. Now, number one is always first do no harm. So anything that we do to our patients needs to be low risk to be worth a benefit, especially when it comes to something like atrial fibrillation. And of course, we want to be able to improve the symptoms, the functional capacity and for atrial fibrillation. We want to be able to reduce the stroke morbidity if we can reduce the mortality rate. For crowd balloon ablation, it has popularized ever since its inception, since 2007. And here you can see some of the landmarks over to since uh, well, almost 15 years ago. And um, you know, this is uh, quite exciting for me because uh, I, I was uh, kind of in the inception from this whole crowd ablation from the onset even, even as a uh, medical student working on one of the first prototype of the crowd ablation catheter with Dr. Paul Wong in Boston and seeing its uh, clinical use, animal trials, and uh, the full launch to all the different variations of catheter has been quite exciting. The you know, clinical experience and what we have seen as the clinical outcome across the world is amassed and it's being fairly amazing in terms of what we have today. And you'll see a lot of that today. And the system has evolved as we have uh, talked about. I will not go through all of the details, but as you can see the different stages of crowd balloon ablation that since 2007, that has the, you know, uh, is, since the inception with the Arctic front where there were four jets just freezing the equator to the use of a chief catheter to map a pulmonary vein to find out what the dosing should be and find out efficacy uh, to the more advanced balloon with the entire hemisphere, increasing from four to eight jets and to the uh, use of various sheath and advanced catheter. So all these have brought us uh, advantages to perform a crowd balloon ablation which allow us to have pulmonary vein isolation as safe as possible. And eventually it led to the uh, inception of first line uh, 
ablation, which is now indicated for ablation for AFib prior to the failure of antiarrhythmic drugs. So just looking across the crowd balloon ablation platform, as we have mentioned, the single shot approach with a mapping catheter to simplify the procedure, reduce it for a uh, procedure time to be able to go across the left atria, get the high yield area done, is a fairly good idea and has popularized around the world. And similarly, now we have the Boston Scientific Balloon, that says with Crowd Balloon, that has a similar platform with some mild changes to the sheath, to the balloon, as opposed to the mapping catheter that was similarly performed just as well. And while there are several other companies working on similar platforms, we'll leave the Crowd Balloon as the approved product here, as this is uh, studied in US now, approved in Europe, but it's uh, awaiting several different things. Now, a couple of exciting differences in different crowd balloon. And here I'll just show some of the differences, including ablation pressure between the Medtronic balloon versus Boston Scientific balloon. Where on the left, you can see the Medtronic Arctic front advance will increase in pressure and size. And some of us can be you know, very critical about the pros and cons of what that means, because uh, sometimes with the uh, Medtronic balloon, we are able to get a more osteo occlusion if it's a higher pressure. But at the same time, the occlusion status may change as we start ablation. The Boston Scientific Balloon actually is still a very viable platform and that's different material. So stand, but the ablation pressure actually stays constant. So as we go to ablation, the size and pressure does not change and is able to maintain you know, the occlusion status that we see. So if you look at the actual pressure, uh, Boston Scientific Balloon stays fairly constant, but the profile for ablation is actually slightly different, and the dosing is slightly different. So there are still a lot of things to be you know, learned about you know, what is to come. So just to jump ahead, because we only have uh, 10 minutes, you know, what, is, what is in the store for us? Of course, you know, we're looking for safer procedure that's more effective and more efficient. And one thing that makes it very clear that throughout the world as crowd balloon launch is reproducibility. So dosing, I will not uh, go, I mean, the safer procedure, I'm not going through too much as there's a later talk about it. But as I go around the world to look at, you know, how everybody does the procedure, there's something that's very constant. And I think where we can improve is truly anticoagulation prior to transeptal access that will reduce the risk of thrombus formation as well as if cost is a not is a acceptable, the use of intracardiac echo to minimize that com complication. Minimizing sheath exchange has been something that's come about. There has been safe set wires, AccuCross system, different beta system. Now it's able to allow single sheath access without sheath exchange that will reduce the risk of the sheath exchange as well as the uh, increased floral use. Dosing a cryo balloon has been well worked out over years, and there are still things that to be worked out, such as cryo stacking, you know, ablating the same area over and over again, because the uh, postural wall, such as esophagus, may not warm up as quickly. So these are all things that actually is things that we are working on. Uh, you take this opportunity to also talk about the safety. Right? What does crowd stacking mean? So if we look at the chart such as this, that measures esophageal temperature, this is after the ablation and the crowd balloon is warming. In the red, you'll see the crowd balloon warms fairly quickly because it's in the blood pool, but esophageal temperature actually warms very, very slowly. So even you know, about a third of the time, we'll have esophageal temperature decrease uh, less than 25 degrees when we record with a high fidelity recording in the esophagus. And some of them are very significant temperature decreases that can be reached even within two minutes. And this thermal latency is definitely there where we have rewarming that is very delayed. Therefore, the warming of the esophagus can be as long as seven minutes. Therefore, ablation at the same spot before this balloon is the esophagus is ready to be ablated to be frozen again can actually cause additional injury to esophagus. 
So this will increase the understanding such as this phenomenon can actually increase the safety. There are a lot of things we can say about silent ischemic events when it comes to different energy sources as well. I will not go too much into that, but it's always interesting when we have radio frequency ablators looking for crowd balloon ablation when they are the one getting ablated. Efficacy of the crowd balloon is always interesting. Now we have gone through all the ways we can ablate AFib. Now we have, so we found out that four vein isolation also works for persistent AFib by getting rid of the high yield area. So therefore we have indication for that. Extra pulmonary vein lesions now has also been looked at. And, uh, but I think I do say that with caution as extra ablation where it's not needed definitely can cause trouble. You know, we can create beautiful pictures like this where posterior wall may be isolated. However, we do not consistently do that in every persistent or long-standing persistent AFib patients. Typically, if we have you know, a posterior wall that looks very fractionated, we definitely can do this to have termination of atypical flutter. However, if we do have a atypical flutter or incomplete line that's left, we just set up the patient for the perfect atypical flutter because the best lesion in the heart is a transmural lesion and the second best lesion is no lesion. So very small voltage area like this is left from prior ablation sets up for incessant atypical flutter. And we have seen this over and over again in different patients with roof lines, for example, that's being done. And with the connecting uh, isthmus, that can be as low as zero point. 0.5 millivolts. Technique will actually improve over time. There are all sorts of different techniques that's being looked at to improve. Occlusion, while it's important, is not critical and it's not, not a possible always. So and segmental isolation is what we often uh, approach. Uh, an antrum that is not perfectly round, which is probably a half of the pulmonary veins we go after to get that perfect pulmonary vein isolation, we do need segmental isolation to get that perfect isolation. So these are all the different techniques that we'll be working on. The different models and different mapping ways, we can look at see why these are all imperfect lesions, even though they may be intuitive to have a PV isolation, but the intro modification that's not fully done definitely can cause trouble. Therefore, segmental isolation, enlargement of the antrum are all things that we have done to make sure that the pulmonary vein isolation is as perfect as it can be. A uh, very common area, for example, right superior pulmonary vein anteriorly. Now, just about every other pulmonary vein isolation we do with crowd balloon, if we look at anterior right superior pulmonary vein, often have uh, this half done area that becomes perfect foci for atrial tachycardia if the contact anteriorly is not great. Different ways that we do ablation and modification of even right middle veins is in the past thought that we, we can cover it up well enough, but often we can leave isthmus such as this in the right middle vein, which of course we wanna be able to see that in advance and be able to modify that well from the very onset. So I think crabble ablation has come a long way. Contact makes it easy that being able to focus on contact, getting aggressive with segmental isolation will all improve our outcome. And there are a lot of data, a lot of centers are looking at and uh, looking at all these different things that you'll see here and here throughout the day, hopefully will give us a lot more excitement about how to make the crowd balloon procedure even better than we have right now. I will leave it as there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. So uh, this presentation is uh, now open for a discussion. So do you have uh, any comments or questions for this paper? So uh, Dr. Su, uh, wonderful talk. I'm very much uh, impressed by your uh, talk. So uh, regarding the, uh, the PV antrum isolation, so uh, you mentioned that you don't prefer the, the uh, single shot PV isolation, but segmental PV isolation at the antrum level, right? 
Correct. So uh, how many times that on the one side you can finally isolate the epsilon two bands? Yeah. So, so I think about half. Me. Yeah. So about half of the time, I would say the crowd balloon happened to fit fairly well. And I actually look at the time to isolation uh, to help guide that. Usually, if the time to isolation is less than 30 seconds, you have very good temperature, that's nadir temperature, that's cold, that shows that we have very good contact. So usually, veins that isolate under 30 seconds, we do a three-minute freeze, and I'm fairly comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the good and bad of having had so much crowd balloon ablation is also having a lot of redos. So when we go back and redo with high-density mapping with, uh, say, Orion on the Arrhythmia system, we can clearly see that there are different weaknesses that we see in crowd balloon ablation, such as left superior pulmonary vein anteriorly and right superior pulmonary vein anteriorly, a typical area that doesn't get the best lesion, not as good as I think. And right, superior, right inferior vein and left inferior vein inferiorly are the weak areas. And if you think about it mechanically, that makes sense because that's how we push the sheath and how we engage the balloon. So typically what I do differently now is that for you know, veins that I think looks very ovoid or even just as prophylaxis for left-sided vein, like left superior vein, if it isolates uh, under one minute, but greater than 30 seconds, I will do a second lesion with the balloon pushed toward anterior part to have the anterior ridge frozen again for three minutes. And uh, when we go back and look at high density map with that, it looks a lot better. And, um, and so, and, you know, in the past, when we looked at time to isolation, it, it was kind of a guess to see what acute isolation means for chronic isolation. And I find that even at under one minute of uh, time to isolation, I have recurrences, which was a surprise to me. But under 30 seconds will be very rare. Right. So I've been, I use 30 seconds as my cutoff as good enough of time to isolation for a single shot and everything else while I'm waiting for the freeze to happen, I will look on ice and look at the angle to see where I have the worst engagement area. And I'll be very bold and push and change the angle of the engagement. Now completely another way to engage different part of the antrum to really enlarge the antrum to make sure that we don't leave any half ablated area uh, and, and have a wider area circumferential ablation. Okay, okay, thank you. But when you put at uh, the uh, right side anteriorly, so I think the, uh, the, the neighboring structure is, is the uh, posterior wall of right atrium. So um, do you notice that in the uh, right atrium posterior wall often you can cross the half lesions there. And the, I think the voltage will come down and sometimes you can force non-homogenized scar there, but this is a proarrhythmic substrate. Yeah, definitely. We don't want to leave proarrhythmic substrate. I understand the concern, but what I end up finding is that the anterior part, if it's not done well, it's just not done well, right? You yeah. still leave half, half a bladed area there. And there's actually a very wide band typically. And um, so we have map after map on high density map of my own redos on the right superior vein where I take the RF catheter and really do a wide area circumferential lesion to terminate you know, the atrial tachycardia arising from that site. So a second lesion with a push uh, uh, you know, clockwise toward, uh, you know, toward the septal side, uh, not to uh, really engage the right atria, but then just to make sure that at the antrum level, I'm actually getting a full thickness lesion. That hopefully will really reduce the risk of that uh, half ablated area. Okay, okay, thank you. Oh, good hello. I have, some, I have uh, uh, one question for Dr. Webersu. Dr. Webersu, uh, uh, very nice to meet, uh, uh, yeah, to meet you. I have one question. You know, in uh, some cases, <clears throat> non uh, occluded. Uh, uh, crab brown abrasion uh, technique uh, could be used for, uh, for abrasion of the crana of the roof. Uh, how long time uh, should be used for abrasion? How to assess the lesion size? How to assess whether uh, 
the legion is durable or transient legion. Yes. So yeah. So the dosing of extra polymer lesion is always by right, uh, what we uh, said uh, initially was guesstimates, right? Because we have to start somewhere. So they. So we started the second generation cryo balloon dosing at four minutes because first generation was four minutes because the freezer max was four minutes, right? So there was no dosing study done. But when we looked at dosing for a thinner area. Uh, so dosing means that we want to get as minimum a transmural lesion. So from what we can see, there's some MR data out there. There's some lesion in animal work there that above two minutes, the contacted area typically will have transmural lesion. Of course, the other limit of dosing is collateral damage. So typically on the roof, we push posteriorly. So we do still have to be careful of esophagus. So now just like painting, Two thin layers of paint is better than one thick layer. So I'd rather have the repeated lesion of two minutes that will just get the proximal contacted area, right? It's contact-dependent lesion and energy transfer. So a crowd balloon that is ablating for two minutes times two even with the warming is better than a three-minute lesion, right? So the two minutes is typically what I use for the roof area because that's also variable. An 80-year-old lady is different than a 30 year hypertrophic heart. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's definitely some variation there. But collateral injury, so on the left superior vein side, left main uh, bronchi is a problem if you freeze for a long period of time. Esophagus is definitely another one. But in general, if you keep it under two minutes, esophagus is very safe. So I use that as a guide. As far as how to assess a line of block, I typically will do 3-dimensional mapping if I do a lesion. And preferably, you want to use a real mapping catheter to really see how it is. Now, I myself have had reconnections. So I can say that, that yes, it's critical to have a very transmural lesion. So I will pace and determine reversal of activation. So if you happen to be on the roof, like what you mentioned, you can place uh, a chief catheter at the roof area with one side touching the roof, the other side the posterior wall, and you can paste the posterior wall and see how it comes around. Usually the delay will be greater than 120, 130 milliseconds uh, for sure. And um, so that's at least what I do to make sure that I have a complete transmural line. Okay, thank you, Dr. Su. So time, the time is a little bit behind, so uh, we will move to the next presentator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Su. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Mark uh, D.L. from Canada, and the title of his talk is uh, Same Day Discharge for Atrial Fibrillation Ablation, uh, Feasibility and Patient Outcomes. So, uh, please. Thanks. You can see my slides okay? Yeah. Perfect. Thanks very much for the invitation. So as mentioned, I'm Mark DL. I work in Vancouver in Canada, along with Jason, our next speaker. Um, and my charge today was to talk a little bit about same day discharge for AF ablation. So this is an increasingly important topic, especially during the pandemic, um, both for cryo and RF. So I'm gonna to touch on both, but we'll, we'll show you data for both modalities. Some disclosure, the only really pertinent one to this talk is that the Canadian Cardiovascular Society funded some of the research I'm going to be presenting. I don't think I really have to tell this group that the costs of AFib, AFib and AFib ablation are going up as we're doing more people as the AFib epidemic unfolds. What maybe is not so apparent is that most of the costs, 56% in many instances in Europe, are related to acute care. And the acute care costs are being dominated by ablation these days. So it's still the default that patients stay overnight and that overnight hospital stay can add up. And this is seen in the fact that about 15%, Australia is maybe an outlier at 30%, but across a number of different jurisdictions, about 15% of the procedure cost is directly related to staying overnight. So that's not insignificant. So what does that mean in 2022? Well, if we're going to be treating more patients, especially as we talk about first-line therapy moving into persistent AF, we need to minimize the impact of AF ablation on the overall healthcare system. We need to streamline things so we can treat more patients. How do we do that? Obviously, we can improve patient selection, 
We can minimize complications. That's very important, of course. Streamlining equipment and maximizing success so we have less repeat procedures. But what I'm going to talk a little bit about is optimizing post-procedure care so that we can limit our impact uh, during the procedural stay. So the big question that everybody wants to know is, is can same-day discharge be safely achieved? Because we don't want to compromise outcomes. First and foremost is patient safety. We don't want to sacrifice that in the name of getting a patient out of hospital early. There's some unique aspects to AFib ablation that make this challenging in comparison to other same-day procedures like SVT ablation, like pacemakers. So multiple venous punctures. We obviously are doing a much more extensive ablation, whether it's RF or cryo. Typically, these are being done with deep sedation or general anesthesia, higher levels of anticoagulation. As Dr. Sue pointed out, we want to initiate high levels of anticoagulation to prevent embolism. These are you know, anywhere from two to four hours or even longer in length. And then periprocedurally, we want to rapidly reinitiate anticoagulation. There's obviously the risk of pericarditis, and there's higher risks of atrial fibrillation immediately post-procedure because of inflammation. Now, what's the current state? This is some data that's very interesting from Europe. This is a survey of European centers in 2020 with the asterisk that this was just before the pandemic. This was a survey of a bunch of electrical or electrophysiology procedures, but at the top I've highlighted that only about 15% of centers were doing same-day discharge or considering same-day discharge for atrial fibrillation, either with cryo or radiofrequency. So it still hasn't permeated, although that has changed in the last few years. Certainly in the United States and North America, there's a lot more centers practicing same-day discharge. So what I'd like to do is go over a little bit of the evidence. This is probably the earliest report. This is from my colleagues in one of the centers in British Columbia in Canada. And this was back in 2010. And the hospitals in British Columbia uh, back in around 2005 to 2010, as the atrial fibrillation ablation volume went up, adopted this as a natural progression because there simply weren't enough beds to keep these patients overnight. And this is the earliest report of a small subset of these patients. Then there's quite a gap, but it became quite a bit more popular to talk about same-day ablation in the late 2010s to early 2020s. And certainly this is accelerated with the pandemic. There's about nine cohort studies, and most of these studies used over overnight observation as the default. And then they attempted to identify a lower risk cohort where they thought same day discharge would be very easy. This is in contrast to what some of the data I'm gonna show you from our local experience. Um, so overnight is the default. And if you look at that strategy, then the amount of patients that you can discharge safely is pretty low. So you're talking about 18 to 42%. There's another report, which I'll show you later with cryo balloon, that's up to 47%. But you can see it's still a minority of the patients going for atrial fibrillation ablation. A lot of these had rigid criteria for discharging home. So they had to be a morning case or live locally, had to have closure, only cryo balloons and various criteria. And they had a wide variety of general anesthesia. In most cases, it was fairly low. Most of these were sedation cases. Um, and then over here, RF versus cryo, there was relatively similar discharge rates between RF and cryo, but I'll show you some more detailed data in a second about the difference between the two. And then they looked at complication rates, which weren't dramatically different, although they varied from study to study. But what we really want to know is complication rates that are identified are identified mostly during the procedure. What we really want to know is what happens in the first 30 days after we discharge these patients home. Is that safe? Are we sacrificing an early discharge, but then they're having complications that land them back in the hospital? So what we did is we actually published our own experience, looking at some our experience from 2010 to 2014, but we considered same day discharge to be the default. So patients were discharged as a default and they only stayed overnight in high risk cases. So this was our, our retrospective experience. We looked at 3,000 patients across two centers, the two dominant centers at the time in British Columbia. This was 2010 to 2014. So you could argue there's some important differences to our contemporary practice with cryobaline, which I'll get to. They basically were admitted to a pre-procedure short stay unit. Anticoagulation was at the discretion of the operator. We used sheaths that were removed immediately in the EP lab or very soon after. 
Uh, no femoral closure devices were used. And then bed rest post-ablation was protocolized between two to three hours, most of the time at three hours. And then the patients were ambulated by the nursing staff, and then they were discharged if there was no access site bleeding and they were feeling otherwise well. Oral anticoagulation was resumed six hours post sheath removal for direct oral anticoagulants and warfarin was continued throughout. Then they were discharged with a support person or family member. And then they had a follow up with the atrial fibrillation clinic in seven to 10 days. So this is our default operator. Some important thing or operation, important things. We didn't use Foley catheters for these patients. This cohort general anesthesia was used in almost all the patients. Um, this was 2010 to 2014. So just as cryoablation was percolating into the Canadian um, ablation scene. So it was 96% RF. And I'll show you some updated data in a second. About 40% persistent. Most of these patients are actually on warfarin. If you look at the time frame, this is just as the direct oral anticoagulants were being used more frequently. And it was a fairly typical ablation cohort with a mean age of 60 years. And we achieved same-day discharge at that time in 79% of patients as a default strategy. And this was our 48-hour readmission. So we divided the patients into three groups. We had same-day discharge. So this is the 79%. There were also some patients who were admitted but did not have a procedural complication. And then the third group in green are patients who were admitted with a complication. And this was their readmission rate after being sent home at 48 hours. And you can see it was relatively low, but it was actually lowest in the patients who had same-day discharge. So 1.9%, which I think is acceptable. This is just expanding it a bit. And then if we move from 48 hours readmission to 30 day readmission, it goes up a bit. It's probably still higher than we want it to be in terms of this is all cause readmission. So some of these proportion are unrelated, but the majority are related to either atrial fibrillation or growing complications. Um, but still you can see the lowest readmission rate was in the, the same day discharge group in blue. And then what we all wanna know is what about complications? So we excluded procedural complications that were identified while the patient was in hospital. And you can see that in this cohort, and this is going back a few years now, that the complication rate after you left hospital, whether you were same day discharge or kept overnight was vanishingly low. So it was 0.37%. So most complications are gonna be identified during the procedure or right after. Interestingly, if you had one complication, you could have another complication afterwards and at a much higher rate. So these are a high-risk patient group that should, of course, be kept overnight. The literature has expanded somewhat. So after we published, there's another large um, series, which is multi-center by Kowalski in 2021, looking at cryo-balloon ablation across multiple centers. And there, it was still not a default strategy, and they still only achieved 47% same day discharge. So it's still the minority. We have an updated experience, which will hopefully be published in the near future, in the next few months. And so we took a, a look at a subgroup of 429 patients because we wanted to have full readmission and emergency room admission data. And 80% were done with RF and 20% were done with cryo, similar to the experience uh, in many other um, jurisdictions. And unlike the previous cohort, this is mostly done on interrupted direct oral anticoagulants. And we achieved 90.5% same-day discharge, again, using no vascular closure. And importantly, there is no difference between the RF and the cryo groups. Also, potentially just with, with time and with better periprocedural care and more structured care, we've reduced the readmission rate at 30 days down to 5.9%, which I think is better. What I haven't shown you here, which we're trying to see, is whether or not there's a trade-off. If you discharge patients at the same day, do they get more emergency room visits? We had a signal from the overall study of 3,000 patients that there maybe was a trade-off with slightly more emergency room visits, but we're looking that, at that in more detail now. The other important thing is always about how do patients feel. It's one thing for us to impose this on patients, another thing for the patient experience. And how can we improve post-procedure care? We're looking at patient education videos that they can watch the next day, in addition to next day phone calls, simple interventions where they can have contact with the nurse to help try to prevent readmission and to help identify complications early. And then also, what's the role of vascular closure to facilitate same-day discharge? So in summary, I'll, I'll close up by saying it's feasible in the majority of cases. It does require a system to be in place, 
It does not appear to increase complications or necessarily readmissions with the caveat of emergency room admissions. And it minimizes the use of hospital resources as AF ablation programs grow. And it can result in significant cost savings. And I'll stop there. And a big thank you, of course, because it's not the physicians who do this. It's actually the nursing staff in the cardiac recovery area who make this happen. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a uh, great uh, talk. So I have one question. So uh, how do you use our, our anticoagulation ORC, or I'm a dark maybe, uh, during the period, period, operative period? Do you continue to dark? Yeah, so we usually, we don't do uninterrupted DOAC. We typically do, we hold the doses for about 24 hours pre, and then we start them six hours post. And then we give heparin with an ACT between 300 to 400 during the case. So we haven't gone to full uninterrupted DOAC. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any comment, questions? <coughs> I'm Dr. Lim from Korea. Thank you for your excellent talk, very interesting. So I'm still wondering the three hours immobiliz immobilization is enough to complete achieve the complete hemostasis at the puncture site? Do you yeah, have- that's a great question. Oh, do you have any, do you use the, some, any special hemostatic material to the hemostasis at the puncture site? No, so we don't routinely, although we are exploring that, but we just do protamine administration in the lab and we typically nowadays pull the sheaths in the lab and compress for about 15 minutes in the lab while the patient's waking up. And then we only use manual compression or clamps. We don't use um, any, any sort of suture device. We've looked at hemostatic materials, but in reality, most of this is just manual or clamp. That being said, the vast majority of patients don't even need a clamp. And so just manual compression while they're in the lab, and then they go out to the recovery area. And the vast majority of patients don't bleed. There's a, some of the nurses feel that potentially with cryoablation that they may need a slightly more prolonged manual compression time. And we're looking into that to get a little more granular data. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. DL. So let's move uh, to the next speaker. Uh, and the next speaker is uh, Dr. Jason uh, Andrade, uh, also from Canada. And the title of his talk is our first line cryoaberration trials for uh, half, uh, stop AF first, REF and cryo first. So Dr. Andrade, please. Thank you very much for asking me to join you. It's my pleasure uh, to speak with you today. Uh, what I'm gonna speak with you about uh, is a little bit of a, a building on what you've already hear, heard from Dr. Sue from Banner. Uh, basically, this is the evidence underlying that first line ablation. Uh, here are my disclosures. And so Dr. DL showed you this already. And this is just to give us a sense of the scope of the problem. So what we're looking at with atrial fibrillation is a disease that affects about 3% of the population. It's something that is more common as patients get older, uh, such that you can see over 15% of the population over age 80 being affected by atrial fibrillation. In addition to being common, it's expensive. Uh, Dr. DL has already shown you this uh, image. Uh, effectively, you have one disorder resulting in two and a half percent of overall healthcare expenditures. So clearly, it's a big problem for healthcare systems. When we think about how we want to manage the rhythm of atrial fibrillation, the guidelines currently would recommend a trial of antiarrhythmic drugs first and reserving invasive procedures such as catheter ablation for when patients fail the medications. The problem with this approach is that we know that the medications are more effective than placebo. So this is a network meta-analysis showing you five different medications. In each case, they are relatively better than placebo at preventing atrial fibrillation recurrence. But in absolute terms, the problem is that it's not very good at preventing recurrence. So this is data from our early AF trial that we published last year. And what you can see is less than one third of patients were able to maintain sinus rhythm at one year of follow-up. So that means despite the use of these medications with standardized protocols, achieving good therapeutic doses, 
two-thirds of patients will still have recurrent atrial fibrillation. In addition, we know that the medications aren't well tolerated. So clearly an active medication is gonna be worse than a placebo in terms of intolerance. So it's not unexpected that people are um, discontinuing these medications at a higher rate than placebo. But more, what is more worrisome is there seems to be an association between these medications and increased risk of mortality. And so this is data from the AFFIRM study, which compared rate control to rhythm control. And you can see that antiarrhythmic drug use was associated with a 50% increase in mortality, whereas being in sinus rhythm was associated with a 50% decrease in mortality. And so the problem is, is that maybe the failure of AFFIRM to show benefit with rhythm control may have had to do with the fact that the things we used were toxic. And so this is a loop recorder tracings from two patients enrolled in early AF that were randomized to pharmacological therapy. And you can see on the left bottom slide, a polymorphic wide complex arrhythmia in a patient treated with sotalol who experienced a syncopal event. On the right bottom slide, you can see a monomorphic wide complex tachycardia in a flecainide treated patient. And so clearly medications are not a benign solution to fixing the problem and are associated with risk. If we return back to the meta-analysis that I showed you earlier, you can see that the long-term use of amiodarone is associated with an almost three times increased risk of death. And sotalol is associated with a more than four times increased risk of death. So those medications which dominated in the AFFIRM study are potentially harmful and potentially putting patients at risk. And so then if the recommendations suggest that drugs should be trialed before ablation, maybe we should be going the other way. Maybe we should be doing the ablation first and considering drugs for those where ablation failed that patient. And so this approach was uh, assessed using radio frequency ablation in three small trials, uh, well, three trials, sorry, uh, from 2005 to 2014. The RAFT study, um, showed uh, or evaluated 70 patients. Uh, the Mantra Path study evaluated 290 patients, and the RAF2 study evaluated 130 patients. Uh, these studies, uh, on the whole, were relatively small. Uh, there was high rates of crossover, meaning a large number of patients who were randomized to drugs ended up having an ablation procedure. That type of crossover would um, downplay the benefit of ablation potentially. Uh, in the case of the first RAFT study, uh, there was uh, no blinding to the endpoints, and so there's concern that that may have introduced some bias. In the case of the Mantra PATH study, this is not what we would consider to be a contemporary RF ablation procedure. And in aggregate, these studies had a relatively negative result. So you can see for the, the uh, endpoint of any atrial tachyarrhythmia recurrence, Mantra PATH was a neutral study. Uh, RAFT2 was just positive with a confidence interval of 0 0.99. For symptomatic atrial tachyarrhythmia, the only positive study was the unblinded study. The two blinded studies were actually neutral. And so because of this, the guidelines did not change after these three studies were performed because the results just weren't compelling. Now in the past year, we've seen three other studies emerge. So the early AF study, which was performed in Canada with more than 300 patients, uh, Stop AF First, which was the uh, US-based study, and Cryo First, which is predominantly European, but also had Australian and uh, South American involvement. And these studies took younger patients, people who are generally healthy, uh, not much in the way of comorbidities, and randomized them to antiarrhythmic drugs or ablation as their first therapy. And each of these studies demonstrated a significant benefit to ablation as a first-line therapy. And so in each case, a very consistent result was observed where ablation was significantly better than drugs at preventing recurrent arrhythmia. Now, if you look at this, there's some differences in crossover. So there were no crossovers in early AF, but there were in stop AF and cryo first. Uh, there was some concerns about subtherapeutic uh, antiarrhythmic drug dosing in stop AF first and cryo first. Those two concerns should 
theoretically uh, contrast each other. Uh, but that being said, uh, they exist in the background. If you look at these three Kaplan-Meier curves, though, uh, to your eye, it may appear that they're very different results. So with early AF, it seems like the success in the ablation arm is 57%, but cryo first, the success is 82%. But the important thing to recognize is these studies use different monitoring techniques. And so if we're talking about detecting a recurrence of arrhythmia, it really comes down to how you look for it. And so early AF used loop recorders, which means it's most likely to see uh, recurrences. So it has a theoretical 100% sensitivity at detecting recurrences. However, seven-day holders that were used in cryo first, 24-hour holders and stop AF first, their sensitivity decreases with the shorter time intervals. And so this is an analysis just to highlight this concept that we published in circulation at the beginning of the year, um, which was just taking circa dose data and looking at how monitoring changes the outcomes. And you can see just by using different monitoring, a success of 52% can actually increase to 92% only on the basis of monitoring. So why does that matter? Well, because the monitoring in these studies was very consistently applied in the study, then you should see the same relative effect of ablation. And that's exactly what you saw. So you see that ablation reduces recurrences by about 40 to 50% very consistently across the three studies. And in contrast to those radio frequency studies that I showed you earlier, you now have a very strong and a very consistent result showing you that a first line ablation approach with the cryo balloon reduces recurrence compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. On top of that, we know from early AF and cryo first that symptomatic recurrence, which is not affected by your monitoring, is significantly reduced. And because it's not affected by monitoring, you see very similar numbers between early AF and cryo first. Uh, early AF had loop recorders, so we were able to quantify AF burden. Uh, AF burden is something that can only be measured on a loop recorder or a continuous monitoring device. And you can see that there's a 3% difference in the mean burden of AF between those two groups. 3% may not sound like a lot, but that is actually one day less atrial fibrillation per month when you have an ablation procedure when compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, we know that there were no differences in adverse events. So doing the procedure did not confer additional risk, whether you use the serious adverse event endpoint or any adverse event. Uh, the drugs were not benign. The procedures were not as risky as people may perceive them to be. And on the whole, there was no difference across any of the studies. In terms of quality of life, a very consistent result between early AF and cryo first. You see benefit with treatment, so all patients improved. However, the magnitude of improvement was greater when catheter ablation was performed relative to antiarrhythmic drugs. And that difference was not only statistically significant, but it was a clinically meaningful difference, meaning that five points on the effect score is meaningful to a patient. And here you see a 10 point difference between the two groups. And lastly, if we're talking about doing a procedure as something to start where we are, now you're worried about the downstream cost. So is it uh, upfront financial costs to do an ablation? Well, here you see benefit in terms of healthcare utilization. So patients were seeing less physicians, they were coming to the emergency room less, and there was a substantial 70 or sorry, 60 percent reduction in hospitalization. So in the year following ablation, there was a huge cost savings that came, meaning that that cost of the procedure was balanced by what happened in the year that followed. So if you take these three studies together, we can kind of summarize a very comprehensive understanding of what the endpoint is. And a first line cryo balloon catheter ablation procedure significantly reduces arrhythmia recurrence, uh, less symptomatic arrhythmias, less burden of arrhythmia, which leads to a greater improvement in quality of life, reduced healthcare utilization, hospitalization, and no harm to patients in terms of adverse events. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a great talk, uh, Dr. Andre. So this paper is open for a discussion. Uh, so uh, Han Chen 
from China. Is, uh, so, uh, Dr. Andre, uh, I would like to ask, uh, especially for those pa uh, patients with loop recorders or pacemakers, we frequently found they uh, come back with uh, short run uh, atrial fibrillation, and uh, probably most of them are asymptomatic. So, how aggressive should we uh, put them uh, to consider for uh, ablation? What's your opinion? So are you talking about a first procedure or a second procedure? Meaning they've had an ablation and they have recurrence? I'm, no, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about those patients with uh, devices, with uh, loop recorders yeah. or pacemakers. So if they are asymptomatic, but they have like, uh, like uh, AFib running for like a few hours, should we uh, be aggressive for these patients to put them on uh, ablation? Yeah, so I think that's a, a really great question. Um, you know, I think that where we stand now, ablation is still a procedure to improve quality of life and make patients feel better. Uh, when we uh, enrolled or when we designed early AF, we made the decision to uh, take patients when they were symptomatic and requiring initiation of a treatment. And that's when we randomized them. We didn't take people with their first diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. We didn't take asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. So at least now we can say the evidence is strongest for patients who are symptomatic because when they're symptomatic, they come to the emergency room, they come to hospital, they need medications to improve their quality of life. Um, now that being said, we know from Circa Dose, we published this last year as well, that if the AF episodes are starting to be longer than 24 hours, the ablation procedure results are inferior. So we want to get them early enough that those episodes are lasting less than 24 hours. That's where you're going to have the greatest benefit in terms of your ablation outcome. And that 24-hour threshold also seems to be consistent with where the risk of stroke seems to increase from data we know from a CERT. So for people who are minimally symptomatic with a low burden and short episodes, I may not chase that from a clinical perspective, but if they're bothered by their episodes, their quality of life is impaired, they're symptomatic, then those are the people I would be more inclined to intervene upon. Well, good. thank you. Okay, so uh, Dr. Andre, so the recurrence rate are between the three studies are uh, uh, different, uh, depending on the monitoring after uh, the procedure. So uh, loop recruiter can detect uh, much more uh, the recurrence. So uh, do you think uh, you need to uh, monitor uh, using the loop recruiter after the operation in all cases? Uh, so I personally would say no. Because if we're doing this pre procedure to make people feel better and to improve their quality of life, detecting short runs of atrial fibrillation that last 90 seconds on a loop recorder is probably not going to benefit people. Um, <coughs> so I, I think that the focus really should remain on making sure people are well. If I'm designing a research study where I want to know with absolute certainty and no chance of type 2 error which treatment is better, I'm going to put a loop recorder because I don't want to miss 50% of recurrences. Okay, thank you very much. So let's move uh, to the next speaker. So uh, the final speaker of this uh, lecture session is uh, Dr. Tadashi Hoshiyama from Japan. Uh, the title is uh, Effects of the, the ARDH2 Variant on the Prevalence of AFIV in Habitual Drinkers. Dr. Hoshiyama, please. Thank you for uh, inviting me as a speaker. I am very honored to be here. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, today, I would like to present effect of the LD2 variant on the prevalence of atrial fibrillation in habitual drinkers. Uh, first, this slide shows the current ESC guidelines for management of AF. This guideline describes the AF treatment as ABC pathway. Of course, anticoagulation for avoiding stroke and rhythm control and rate control for 
better symptom control are very important. In addition, this guideline emphasized the risk factor management. Among the risk factors, reduction of alcohol is also described. With respect to the relationship between AF and alcohol consumption, alcohol affects two effects. And it, those are uh, cell effect and autonomic effect. With respect to the cell effect, more people take alcohol, the low voltage area are increasing in left atrium. And the more people take alcohol, filtrate variability is increasing. It has been advocated that these mechanisms lead AF genesis. Actually, uh, it has been shown that new AF onset and habitual alcohol consumption has a causal relationship. And uh, following cavity ablation, abstinence from alcohol reduce AF recurrence. And the patient without antiarrhythmic drug and without undertaking cathetic ablation, only abstinence from alcohol reduce AF attack. These findings imply how alcohol important, both AF genesis and AF maintenance. At this point, I would like to explain how, how the alcohol metabolizes. Uh, alcohol is metabolized in two steps. First, it is metabolized to acetaldehyde by alcohol aldehyde. And this acetaldehyde is uh, metabolized by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase 2. This is the ALDH2. This ALDH2 genotype has two genotypes. The one is uh, ALDH2 star 1, star 1, so called wild type genotype represented high tolerance for alcohol, and the LDA2 deficient variant genotypes. This variant genotypes consisted uh, two genotypes, and star 1, star 2 represented reduced activity of LDH2, and star 2, star 2, negligible activity of LDH2. This LDA2 deficient variant carriers is relatively rare in the world, However, the ALD2 deficient variant carriers are prevalent among East Asian population. This figure shows the geographic distribution of ALD2 deficient variant carrier. As shown in this figure, the deficient variant carriers are a high proportion in especially China and Japan. And the past report also indicated the proportion is increasing up to 40% in East Asia. Therefore, uh, we speculated if the uh, patients with a LDA2 deficient variant carrier who take alcohol, the AF episodes are more frequent to observe compared to LDA2 wild type carriers with habitual alcohol consumption. Therefore, we investigated the relationship between LDH2 genotypes and the prevalence of AEF. Among 10,603 patients, ischemic heart disease, cardiomyopathy, and thyroid disease patients were excluded. And the remaining 656 patients uh, were included in this study. And they are <clears throat> investigated whether they have AEF or not. And the multivariate analysis were applied to determine the correlation between ALDH2 genotypes and AF, including other AF risk factors. And with respect to the proportion of ALDH2 genotypes, now ALDH2 star 1 star 1 and ALDH2 star 1 star 2, ALDH2 star 2 star 2 were 65.5 and 30.3 uh, and 4.1% respectively. This proportion is consistent with the past report in East Asia. Uh, this table shows the uh, patient's characteristics. As shown in this table, compared to the LDA2 wild type carrier and LDA2 star 1 star 2 carrier, uh, 
LDA to study, study careers are significant country, smaller left atrial diameter, and uh, smaller proportion of atrial fibrillation, and absence of drinking habit. These are significantly different. And with respect to the proportion of AF types of each ALDA2 genotypes, the all uh, AF types were not significantly different. This is a relationship between AF and variables. Of course, age over 60 years old, hypertension, male, and habitual alcohol consumption have close relationship for AF. However, LDA2 stubborn study carriers were not significantly correlated with AF. On the contrary, LDA2 study study carriers had a lower incidence of AF. This may owing to the uh, absence of alcohol consumption. However, uh, this, the relationship between AF and ALDA2 genotypes in regard to habitual alcohol consumption was lacking in this analysis. Therefore, variables in ALDA2 genotypes and habitual alcohol consumption were divided into five categories. These categories were ALDA2 wild type without alcohol and ALDA2 wild type with alcohol. LDA2 Stauron Stauron, Stauron, sorry, Stauron Statue without alcohol, LDA2 Stauron Statue with alcohol, and LDA2 Statue Statue without alcohol, and multiple analysis was performed again. As shown in this figure, LDA2 Stauron Statue carriers itself is not uh, significantly di uh, different, but the LDA2 Stauron Statue carriers with habitual alcohol consumption show the highest odds ratio among these variables. And this slide shows the relationship between AF and alcohol consumption volume in each LDA2 genotypes. Both LDA2 wild type carriers and LDA2 stubborn statue carriers, uh, the patient, the higher the amount of alcohol consumed, the higher risk of AF was observed. Uh, in addition, this phenomenon is became more pronounced among ALDA2 stubborn statu carriers. In summary, ALDA2 stubborn statu carriers itself was not a risk factor of AF. However, ALDA2 stubborn statu carriers with habitual alcohol consumption had a strongest risk factor for AF. However, ALDA2 statu statu carriers had a lower incident of AF owing to uh, absence of ab habitual alcohol consumption. This is my conclusion. Abstaining from alcohol could prevent the genesis of AF, especially for LDA2 stubborn statue carriers. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hoshiyama. So this paper is uh, open dis for discussion. Any comments or questions? I'm Dr. Lin from Korea. Yes, please. Thank you for your excellent talk. Do you think the, the alcohol, the chiromyopathy is related to the ALDH2 polymer pigeon? Do you have any data of the uh, HR scar, the demand, the degree of the HR scar or the, the MR finding in your study? Thank you. Uh, this is very important problem, I think. Uh, this problem is now is undertaken. But in my impression, the MRI, uh, using MRI, the uh, scar is not uh, correlated with uh, LDA2 variant with uh, habitual alcohol consumption. But in the voltage, voltage map using multipolar mapping catheter, uh, LDA2 stubborn study carrier with alcohol consumption has a, a larger low voltage area uh, compared to the LDA2 wild type. Even they have taken a large amount of alcohol. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you.
Any more comments or questions? Hi, it's Wilbur Sue here. Yes, so please. So we have always noticed that uh, and have recommended the patient that given post afib ablation, what um, typically contributes to the recurrence of AFib is alcohol consumption. Do you think the mechanisms are similar? So do you mean the recurrence is uh, uh, following cartilage ablation related to the genotypes with alcohol consumption? Right, versus the, uh, when we have recurrence of AFib versus the uh, initiation of AFib. I think this is an uh, important thing. Um, in my impression, the genesis of AF is increasing uh, more high, uh, more uh, significantly observed uh, observed than uh, AF uh, LD2 variant with habitual alcohol consumption, um, but uh, not significantly different. The uh, when coming to the hospital, the first uh, detection in atrial fibrillation, they are mostly the persistent or uh, uh, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. So the uh, result of catheter ablation is in, uh, tend to be uh, lower compared to the wild type with habitual alcohol consumption. The, Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hoshiaba and all of, all of uh, four distinguished, distinguished uh, doctors uh, for uh, your great work. So uh, we will close uh, this uh, keynote speech session and let's move to the uh, case presentation se session. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Min Lon Chan to moderate the case presentation. Okay, so uh, we will move on to the uh, case discussion session. So uh, we have two cases. The uh, first case will be presented by uh, Dr. Yu Fan, and he has a case of cryo-ablation excellence. So Dr. Fan, please. Thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, I'm, uh, it's an honor for me to uh, present the cryo balloon case ablation for one or two cases by you, you, can you see the slides? Yeah. Okay, so it's case a cloud balloon cast the bridge for one little case. So let us see the case information first. This is a 66 year old female. His two plays current palpitation for four years and the recurrence of age of fibrillation after initial radio frequency cast the bridge in at hospitals four months ago. No. Medicine history. The diagnosis is persistent age of fibrillation. This is a uh, uh, 12 liters ECG show the age of fibrillation. So we do the echo and the CD scan of the left edge. The echo showed uh, left edge of AP dimension is, is uh, enlargement is 4.01 centimeter and the LOV injection fraction is nearly 60%, is normal. So she also had the mild uh, mitral regurgitation. The left edge of CD scan showed a very large uh, left uh, superior uh, pulmonary vein, ostium, and uh, very large and uh, deep uh, ISP with very sick. So this is my difficult to complete occlusion of the left uh, LSP uh, and uh, my go to deep into the ISPV when we do cloud ablation. So when we uh, put the secure mapping cassette in the primary wheel, we found the PV potential recovered in four primary wheels. So for this case, what's the strategy for, for this little case? Just do PVI uh, isolation again, or just and PVI isolation and the linear ablation. So then we see the the two seven six yes yes guidelines. The PVI is the co cornerstone for the AF ablation as is uh, for persistent AF. So the, well, when we do persistent age of fibrillation ablation, the the first procedure maybe we we look to the pulmonary wind isolation. The target is complete PV isolation. So when the AF we, we detect. So we do the second procedure, 
So first we verify isolation of the all family widths. So the family PVI is incomplete. So first we complete the PVI again. Then we maybe consider additional ablation. For, for this case, we found the PVI incomplete in all family wins. So we may be uh, complete the PVI again, and then we may be consider additional ablation, such as roof lines. So in this case, we do uh, complete, complete the PVI again, and we do a roof line ablation by cloud balloon. So we do so we do the uh, left the swell and uh, blade first. So we we do multi failure in total occlusion of the LSPV. So we do segment to the blade close to the upper and the lower edges of the our SPV was performed. So we first do the upper, uh, upper edges of the LSPV ablation, and we do the lower edge of the LSPV ablation. But uh, no changes after slide prolongation of potential intervals. So we think maybe cross torque phenomenon from the RIPV. So we can we perform RIPV ablation instead. So the when we do uh, LIPV uh, ablation, we found the LIPV potential gradually prolonged and dropped during uh, cloud ablate, ablation. And the TDI is 20 seconds. And the covered two sides with them during cloud for 103 uh, seconds. So this, uh, after the cook occlusion of the cloud LIPV, the balloon and the sheets were Pressed and uh, benched against the inferior edge of the LIPV for additional 120 seconds uh, cloud abl ablation. Then we go back to the LSPV to map it after the LIPV isolate isolation. So the potential remains, so we exclude in the cross torque phenomenon. So we combine with the initial ablation status of LS LSPV. Adjust the sheets and the balloon to contact the roof line and then perform a blade. The potential was gradually prolonged and the job. The TTI is 52 seconds and we, we applied about 180 seconds. Then we do the roof line, half, uh, left half of roof line, a blade was performed after SPV isolation. We, we, we applied the step by step. Uh, and then we, uh, one, one, uh, about one second, 120 seconds per, per, per ablation. Then we go, go to the right LSPV and we do seven attempts for, for LS, RSPV total occlusion because it failed due to the very, very wide uh, HM. So we do segment with the ablate ablation close to the upper and the lower edge of the RSPV was conducted. And the, the potential is gradually dropped when, when we do the, when we do the, 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 lo, uh, the lower edge ablation. And the TTI is 26 seconds and we do uh, two times of one, 180 seconds ablation. Then we do the roof line, uh, right half of the roof line blade was performed after ISP isolation. We just uh, uh, each for 120 seconds each of the blade. Then we go to the RIP ablation. The RIP potential is also present. So we apply segmented contact and uh, uh, check the we checked HU after the cloud until the potential was dropped. We do about one, two, two times of uh, ablation for each 180 seconds. Then we continuous LSPV ablation because upon complete of RIPV isolation, we each 
POV potential we rechecked and uh, we found recovery of LSPV potentials. So we may be seeing the low edge of the LSP was not the perf perfect close to the anterior wall. So we press and bend the, the balloon and, the, and the counterclockwise load the sheath and the balloon to, for good contact of the anterior wall of the, of the LSPV. Cloud ablation was performed and the LSPV potential was uh, prolonged and uh, dropped. Uh, the TDI is uh, 33 uh, seconds. And after the observ observation for 20 minutes, the LSPV potential did not recover. So we, we, we finished this case. It's awesome. So from, from this interesting case, my opinion is PVI maybe the key of successful ablation for age of fibrillation. And also cloud balloon cast ablation of little cases may be less label, especially for PV, PV, PVI in completed in, in completed, even, even to, so in three primary wins. This is my case, thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fan, so very uh, good case. Actually, this is a recurrent case of persistent AF and the uh, 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 previous ablation is done by uh, IF ablation, but actually from your case, the uh, recurrence is due to the uh, recovery of the uh, pulmonary vein uh, activation. So uh, a good case. So I like to invite all the panelists to take questions. So any question regarding yep. this? Hi, uh, Serin from Bangkok, Thailand. I think it's an interesting case and it just echo what was said uh, in the plenary session that the contact is at most important. I know this is difficult case, the atrial is uh, huge. Would you ever consider not monitoring pulmonary vein potential at all? Because there was a try uh, comparing between cases that, um, uh, cryo cases uh, doing during uh, PB potential monitoring versus not monitoring. And they said uh, the results are approximately the same because sometimes you manipulate the uh, balloon too much and it could be just you versus the balloon, not you versus the patient and it could uh, result in uh, serious complication. Would you consider just, you know, let it go? We, we see we have good occlusion, just let the PB potential go. I'm sorry, uh, I don't. Okay, I mean, um, the occlusion is quite uh, difficult because the anatomy, would you consider yeah, yeah. just, uh, you know, not watching the PV potential at all and try to get a better occlusion? Because there was a try comparing between um, doing cryo balloon without yeah. monitoring the PV potential. Uh, and they said the results are approximately the same. Because sometimes when you manipulate the balloon too much, it could cause the complication, you know, not just a simple AF pr uh, procedure could turn to be uh, an open heart procedure. I think the money, money the PV <laughs> potential during the blade is very, very important because we want to see the uh, TTI during the cloud ablation. So we try our best to uh, to uh, to monitor the, the PV potential. I think we we uh, for we during the procedure we should uh, try our best to 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 record the PV potential during the procedure. So if it's difficult, maybe we need to uh, to to uh, uh, when you go the contact of the cloud balloon to the oxygen of the. The so pulmonary wind and we do angiography, maybe, maybe, yes. And we, we see the lowest the temperature of the during the, the, the ablation. If the lowest uh, temperature is, yeah, is, 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 is,
uh, in 30 seconds to 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 uh, less than uh, negative 40 uh, 40 template 40 40 template maybe is, is a good i think negative Doctor Fan, uh, this is Zulu, uh, Zulu Wang. Uh, uh, I have a question: uh, How to choose the patients uh, by using the uh, cryobrone ablation or the radio frequency castration uh, for the cases after recurrence by using the uh, cryobrone ablation? Because, uh, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, 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 for this patient, because the uh, anatomy uh, using the uh, radio frequency calibration may be uh, more easy, uh, maybe easier uh, for this case. Yeah. Yes, we do um, uh, some case of uh, little case by radio frequency as a, uh, for the first procedure, but the second procedure we use. Uh, Cloud balloon. Uh, so before the we use choose the cloud balloon, we we use the circular mapping test to to mapping the PV potential. If the PV potential uh, recovered, maybe we we can use the cloud balloon first to do PV PV isolation again, and then we can do roof line by by uh, cloud balloon. Then we can induce uh, to make EP mapping during the, uh, at the end of the procedure. If we can, we can uh, induce some uh, uh, macro range uh, agiotech cardia. Maybe we can use the uh, uh, radio frequency cancer to uh, play the, uh, the isthmus line of the, the macro range tech cardia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. F yes. Dr. Fan, this is Dr. Sindek here. I just want to ask you, when you start doing your procedure, the patient was in atrial fibrillation, do you cardiovert first so that you can see the TTI better? Or do you just go ahead and do your cryo first and then uh, later on check for the exit block and things like that? So when we do the cryo balloon, uh, cryo balloon applied for the uh, PVI, we, we, we just do it in uh, HO, Age of fibrillation. Then, when we the, when there is a <coughs> natural silence reason, maybe we can mapping mapping the PV potential again in silence reason. And sometimes we can use the three D mapping system to ma ma measure the voltage of the left atrium and the primary win. Okay, so basically you are doing a hybrid procedure every time you do a cryo. <coughs> you have an electro mapping system at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah, because generally in our center, we don't do that. We only use a cryo balloon as by itself. So we have to uh, cardio with them to sinus and then do the uh, ablation because then we can see the TTI better. That's what we do in our center. I don't know what it is the other uh, response from the other speakers. Yeah. I agree with Dr. Surinder because um, it's, it's the cost issue if we pull up two systems. Generally, I do cryo versus, you know, our uh, 3D mapping, just pick one. Otherwise, you know, patient, can, I mean, no one can afford it. We are a poor country. Because of the cost? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because of the cost. Yes, oh. definitely. Yeah. So I have a question. So, uh, Dr. Fan, uh, because clearly this is a recurrent case, but caused by the uh, 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 driver of the uh, left inferior. So, when you ablate the left inferior, actually the position is terminated to a sinus rhythm. So do you think you still need to do the uh, roof line? So I think less is more. So if it's clearly triggered if or driven if by the pulmonary vents, I think durable PV isolation is enough. You don't have to do the, uh, the roof, any other lines. Otherwise you, you should check whether this line was uh, uh, completely uh, blocked bidirectionally. Yes, I agree. Your, your. So because this is a little case, maybe we we we, we can we just uh, do a little more about the uh, roof line because we uh, 
we do more, we, after the procedure, we do a uh, voltage mapping. There is a uh, total uh, uh, bi bilateral block of the roof line. So I think uh, for this patient, maybe we didn't need to do any more for linear ablation. Yeah. Okay, so any other hey. comment? Yeah, I'm Dr. Lin from Korea. Thank you for your interesting case. As Dr. Wilbur Su also mentioned today, the PBI itself is not enough and uh, additional enteral ablation is more important because the, when you look at the, the array the volume rendered image, the left side is, looks like the common common os and uh, the osteum of the LSPB is a little bit bigger. That's why the, this uh, PBI is not enough in this case. That's why the done additional, the enteral ablation to create the wide circumferential enteral ablation is more important in this case. So I think the, right, the LIPV is the trigger AV, but uh, you have to the, eliminate the, all the enteral potential in this case because the, it is very important in my experience. Yeah. How do how do you think in this case? Yeah, I think there are very uh, several interesting things about this case, and um, you know this goes back to what we were talking about that one balloon doesn't always fit at all, and uh, there are uh, as much as we like to think that you know is less technically dependent, is very reproducible. Uh, this is a case that highlights. Uh, where some of the better understanding of PV anatomy and how the balloon engages the vein are all very important. So contact is a key somebody mentioned before, and uh, we mentioned segmental isolation is important. So with every ablation, usually if it's um, not isolating, the first thing that I'll be looking at is even doing a repeat angiogram after you start ablating, because that's typically when the balloon disengages and becomes different engagement than you what you started with when it's just purely in an inflated state. So without ice, and you know, you can be as minimal as possible. You don't need ice. You don't have to have 3D mapping unless you really want to do uh, extra PV lines. But the ability for you to be able to re-image the balloon engagement after you start ablating is important. So the repeat look that we have sometimes promoted is uh, very much highlighted by this case. So after you, you, know, you get a initial engagement, whether you have occlusion or not, about five seconds into ablation, you can shoot another angiogram. You'll notice that your engagement is completely different. If you have a leak, then concentrate on just one side. You know, get the hemisphere out of the way. You know, maybe superior, posterior, then you know the next engagement, you'll deflect the sheath 45 degrees completely the other way, inferior and anteriorly to get the entrum. You know, for even persistent AFib patients, you get the wide area circumferential ablation out of the way because you have a very large entrum modification and, and several, um, I think, uh, expert users also talked about you know, widening of the antrum. Uh, Dr. Miyazaki also published you know, what we talked about for pushing the balloon just outside of the not engaged area. So which is essentially what you were doing there. And that's actually a very good way to create continuous lesion, just extending beyond the white area. But you do have to be careful you're not creating a substrate by partial line in the roof, right? Um, also the, uh, the comment about whether or not you know, do you have to get isolation, right? The outcome it may be similar. Well, that can be said true about any partial ablation, you know, because you look back at all the RF days, you know, you bring them back. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I think Dr. Jiang published at one point that, yeah, out of all the AFib cure patients, quote unquote, 90% uh, of pulmonary veins do not have four vein isolation. But that doesn't mean we can't do a better job by doing a better pulmonary isolation. And technically, using crab balloon is not that difficult. So hopefully that will lead to a better outcome overall. <laughs>
but beautiful case to demonstrate all the, the difficulties in this uh, in this case. And I think there's a lot of learning points that we can take away from it. Thank you for the presentation there. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, with the time limitation, we will move on to the uh, next case. So uh, next case will uh, will be presented by uh, Dr. Uh, Shinsky, but he is not available at this time, and he cannot be online. So um, uh, they will present his pre-recorded video instead of the uh, on-site uh, on speaking. So please. His topic is uh, the real-world safety profile of if ablation using a, a second-generation cry bloom. So Kaczynski is from Tokyo Medical and Dental University Hospital. Please, go ahead. Gentlemen, my name is Shinsuke Miyazaki from Tokyo. I'm very honored for the invitation and grateful to the organizational committee. Today I'm talking about real world safety profile of a fever ablation using a second generation cryobloon in Japan. This is my disclosure. The characteristics of the cryobloom compared to RF ablation are comparable efficacy, different safety profile, shorter procedure time. The second generation cryobloom was approved in July 2014 in Japan, where the second generation cryobloom was the first approved balloon technology. Therefore, Japanese physicians had no balloon technology experience when it was introduced. Regarding the safety profile, the Japanese HRS issued an emergency alert stating the risk of mass severe emboli and reporting four cases with laser results during cryobloom ablation in August 2018. Despite the alert and the case reports, the incidence of air embolisms is still unknown and has not been reported. The purpose of this large multi-center study was to clarify the incidence and the characteristics of real-world complications of cryobloom ablation in Japan. This multi-center observational study consisted of 4,173 patients who underwent cryobloom ablation in 18 Japanese centers. In each center, the data of the consecutive patient series that underwent cryobloom ablation from their first case until the approval of each IRB were collected. All complications during and within three months after the procedure were investigated. A freeze cycle of 180 seconds was applied with 28 millimeter second generation cryobloom. CMAP was monitored during right PV ablation in all cases, but the esophageal temperature was monitored at the operator's preference. So this slide shows the patient characteristics of total population. The mean age was 64 years old, 69% were men, and 91% were paroxysmal AFib. Additional ablation was performed in 66% of patients. Complications associated with the entire procedure were observed in 4.9% of the patients. Patients with complication were significantly older and had a lower BMI and a smaller LA diameter than those without. The incidence of complications significantly decreased during the third study period compared to the first and the second study periods. This slide shows the incidence of procedure related complications. As you can see, the most common complication was air embolism. The incidence of phrenic nerve injury was 1.4% and the incidence of cardiac tamponade requiring drainage was 0.36%. 
In this presentation, I will pick up these three important complications. Cardiac tamponade requiring precardiosynthesis occurred in 0.36% of the patients during the entire procedure. Two patients required emergent surgery. All patients recovered after the pericardiosynthesis or surgery. Significant CMAP reduction was observed during the procedure in 2.9% of the patients. Phrenic nerve injury remained the day after the procedure in 1.4% patients. All resolved within 13 months post-procedure. All patients were asymptomatic. Clinically manifesting air embolisms were observed in 1.5% of the patients. In all cases, their embolisms manifested as a transient ST segment elevation in the inferior leads. One patient experienced subsequent VF requiring electrical cardioversion. The ST elevation recovered spontaneously or under supportive care in all. The incidence decreased from the first to the second study period and the second to the third study period. I will discuss the study results. Compared to the baseline patient characteristics in other registries, our study population was relatively older and had a lower BMI. The proportion of persistent AFib was low because the use was not approved during this period in Japan. On the contrary, unlike the other registries, the majority of our study population underwent adjunctive ablation after cryobalum PVI. Overall, 0.36% incidence of cardiac tamponade in our study was in accordance with the data in SAFER registry. Our data, together with the published data, confirm the very low incidence of cardiac tamponade in cryobal ablation procedures. The definition of the phrenic nerve injury slightly differ for each. However, the 1.5% incidence in our study was comparable to the published literatures. The low incidence, even during early study period, can be explained by the establishment of CMAP monitoring as a technique to anticipate phrenic nerve injury before 2014. A common presentation of air embolisms is ST segment elevation in the inferior leads because of the superior position of the right coronary artery ostium in supine patients. It should be noted that the incidence might be underestimated because the slight transient ST elevation could often be missed. The decrease in the incidence over time suggests that Physicians have taken care of this complication more and more. We recently showed that the use of a water bucket can decrease the incidence of air embolisms. The cryobal was inserted into the flex gas in the water bucket. This technique reduced the risk of introducing air bubbles suctioned into the flex gas via the hemostasis valve while inserting the cryobal. Currently, this water bucket is used in many Japanese centers to minimize the risk of air embolisms. In conclusion, this large multi center real world data demonstrated a high safety profile of second generation cryobal ablation, despite including the RE experience and the high rate of adjunctive ablation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shinsky's talk will be uh, open for discussion. So any questions? So as uh, Dr. Su is here, so uh, all the questions is welcome. Uh, I have a question for uh, to, uh, Dr. Shu. Uh, uh, in my center, we have rare cases. 
the patient have the complica uh, complication of air, uh, air embolism. Uh, yeah, what's the rate in our center, Dr. Su? Yeah, so uh, I'll describe one case where we learned the sheath management issues. So in the stop A of trial, the sheath valve are not very competent, yeah, very first generation. I have the sheath transeptal, and I have irrigation going to sidearm while I was prepping the crowd balloon. By the time I turned around, the venturi effect of the sidearm already sucked in a lot of air. This is in retrospect. I had no idea where the air came from initially. Fortunately, the patient did well, but I had air got down all the coronary with a C elevation, a PEA, chest compression, and patient had no sequelae whatsoever, which is beyond my belief. I guess we sucked out a lot of air, fortunately. Now, it was not till later that a, you know, a study uh, coordinator then said, well, you know, we can't flush the sidearm because we're well, sucking air. So this type of practice was never standardized. And so you reach, if you talk to all of us here, we all have different practice of inserting the balloon, pulling back on the sidearm, but the incidence of air that we have now doing what we do is extremely low. I have not seen one in the past three, four years. The only difference I have is that when I um, prep the balloon, I actually don't do what uh, they suggested prepping the under the uh, water. But by inserting the balloon into the valve, I think it does squeegee out quite a bit of the air. And um, you know, if you look at the data Medtronic had in looking at the air content with that type of insertion, it's quite minimal. But I do inject saline into that uh, indentation so I have just a uh, fluid interface when I as I insert slowly. I do not draw back on the sidearm. I know a lot of the users do, and they say they suck back air. I think we're sucking back air from the valve. Then you have air in the column. By inserting the balloon slowly and without drawing back on the sidearm, I have not experienced any air embolic events. So if I actually insert quickly or, do, or try to draw back on the sidearm. That's actually years ago when I see the air issue. So I think that sidearm management and the practice of drawing back, it could be very detrimental. And so I think that's one thing. Um, as far as larger amount of air that actually gets into the, uh, the valve, I think we have to be very careful about the sidearm flushes as we insert. I know many centers do have ongoing flow on the sidearm as you insert, whether it's wire or any instrument. And that larger valve will have injury effect to, uh, to actually sucking air. And this compared to other companies with larger sheath management, they have all guarded against that to have that flow there. And that's very much opposite to the smaller sheath, like the eight Frenches that we used to use, where we do have the sidearm going, thinking that there's more positive pressure in there and prevents air ingress. So at least that's my personal experience. I don't see any other uh, experiment being done other than the fact that after the, uh, the practice of the prepping the balloon underwater was uh, published, uh, at least in the uh, in, in, vi uh, in vitro studies, uh, really has not shown significant amount of air by prepping or not prepping. And I think really it's a sidearm management. Thank you. I just want to add uh, one point to what Wilbur said. So, I mean, I think a lot of the underwater prep, um, at least from the research studies that were coming out, it was focused on um, what you'd see there through microembolic events on transcranial Doppler was the main evidence point. And that's where you were largely seeing the initial shower. So it wasn't air embolism like what was presented in the previous case. It's not high volumes of air that you avert by doing the underwater prep. Uh, everything uh, Dr. Sue mentioned about uh, the sheath management uh, is important. And I think that's how you avoid large volumes of air uh, being inserted uh, you know, unintentionally during the prep or the beginning of the case.
So okay, the uh, but what if the uh, uh, air embolism occurred in coronary uh, artery? So what is the uh, the uh, uh, conservative uh, the the uh, uh, treatment strategy? So, Dr. Andre, Dr. Su, Dr. Zulu. So What's the management so or I can tell you the. Part. I mean, the, uh, the air embolism occurred in the coronary artery. So what is the conservative uh, treatment strategy for such patient? So Dr. Chinsky mentioned that most of the patient can be treated with conservative the, the, uh, treatment. Well, the air will occlude flow. You will have to ask the elevation. So depending on how much air is there, it has to be able to resolve itself and into the capillaries. Otherwise, it's obstructed. So I'm not sure how conservative you can if you have a column of air in coronary, but I can tell you in my case, I had to put in a balloon pump to try to squeeze out all the air I could to see it go through. And, um, and it, uh, the time is of essence to get the coronary, the air out of the coronary, because it will be stagnant there. You will have lack of blood flow. It will be like a STEMI. So I'm not sure how conservative you can be and to watch a uh, ST elevation only to realize later that you should have put in a balloon pump, right? So uh, if it's transient, you clearly go up and you can see it come down. You don't see in that you see So the first thing I do if I see any tr transient ST elevation is I will see and look carefully to see if I see visible air. If you see visible air, that is obvious. That is not going to go through easily. Okay. The other thing to consider, I mean, for coronary air embolism, it's almost always to the RCA because it's just how the patient is positioned when the air goes through. Um, if you put the patient immediately on 100% oxygen, I mean, that's the conservative management, basically trying to reestablish the diffusion of that air out of the, the vessel. I mean, if you had a big uh, pulmonary artery embolism of air and you get a PE arrest in that circumstance, you know, repositioning the patient to help move that air along and get it out of that obstructive sort of shock state would also be helpful. Uh, you can try and aspirate it out, but usually if we're doing a AF ablation procedure, we're not in the coronary circulation to try and go and do that. So it's a bit of a different circumstance. I don't know if, if Mark has anything else to add. Yeah, I think it's it's the, obviously those rare catastrophic cases where you're you're scratching at at very interventional therapeutics. But thankfully, most of these, even if they're moderate, they'll resolve with 100% oxygen. And I think shifting the patient's reasonable. Unfortunately, the right, right coronary artery is also the most arrhythmogenic, so you do get things like Wilbur described and the VF. So you just have to be. So I think we used to put on pads selectively on AF patients, but now we do it routinely just because the $10 you save from saving the defibrillation pads is not worth it in an emergency. Huh. Okay. So uh, any other comments? Okay. I have one quick question. I'm oh. Dr. Lin from Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, the cardiac tamponade is very rare complication during the cryoballoon ablation compared to the RF catheter ablation. So I'm wondering the which part, which portion or which step is the more vulnerable for cardiac fistula or population during the cryoballoon ablation. I have no experience of the cardiac tamponation during the cryoballoon ablation. So far I have done the cryoballoon ablation approximately 1,000 cases. There is no cardiac tamponation. So I'm wondering which portion, which step we should keep in mind to avoid the cardiac tamponade? I mean, I, I think the most likely time that it's going to happen is just in the transeptal puncture. I, I think if you have a safe transeptal puncture during the ablation procedure, you, you don't have the same pressure point. So with an RF catheter, you can poke through the roof because you have a lot of pressure at a small surface area. The cryo balloon is a big surface area. You don't get that pressure point. And so I think you're unlikely to get into a circumstance with tamponade. Uh, I, I have heard of one case where an operator took the Achieve and they pushed it out thinking they were in the vein and went through the appendage. Uh, but that was an operator uh, making a mistake and not understanding the anatomy that they were working with more than something to, technological about the procedure itself. So I think most cryo balloon 
ablation related tamponades are actually transeptal tamponades. I also agree that that's um, the highest risk procedure uh, point. Uh, otherwise, it is a very safe procedure. And I say knock on wood that, you know, the thousands that we have done, we have not had tamponade with the crowd balloon. And, uh, but, you know, in, in some of the teaching cases, uh, one other scenario I've seen is, of course, in the elderly female, when we put the RV catheter for pacing. <laughs> Sometimes that just happens to go through, right? So the little old ladies, I, um, no matter what we do, I'm super careful and delicate with little old ladies. And uh, even dosing, I, I tend to try to cut back by 30 seconds sometimes. You get this 15-second time to isolation. Do I really need three minutes, right? So, so those little old ladies, I, I'm super delicate with. And um, they, may be, they may be tough, but they are delicate. I think uh, the, when we do cloud uh, balloon test ablation, we, we should be uh, aware of the perforation of the left edge appendage. We call two cases of uh, perforation uh, by a chew uh, deep in the left edge of appendage to, uh, to induce perforation. But uh, fortunately, we use the watchman device to uh, uh, close of the left edge appendage, so we avoid the surgery for for the complication. We should uh, consider about the, the achieve uh, induced population of the left edge appendage. We call two cases. So you mean the, uh, the appendage perforation was caused by the achieve catheter and finally yeah, yeah. can be uh, occluded by the uh, uh, watchman device? Yeah, yeah, two cases, yeah. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah. So I have one. I think one it is. Um, go ahead. Uh, uh, the, the report, uh, uh, Miyazaki, the one case uh, undertaken the cardiac surgery for, owing to their cardiac tamponade. Uh, in my experience, the, of course, uh, cry balloon is a safety device and uh, not experience a cardiac tamponade. But uh, uh, do you have any experience of the uh, uh, cardiac tamponade following prayer balloon is uh, more uh, severe drainage or more uh, proportion of the cardiac surgery? Do you have any comment related to the cardiac tamponade? So you mean the... Uh, the uh... A uh, tamponade caused by a cryo ablation is more severe or less severe as compared with the IF ablation? Yes, yes. So, Dr. Su, any comments regarding this? Well, uh, I haven't had a tamponade with a cryo balloon except for the very early on one case where we put a cryo balloon. This was gosh, almost 10 years ago in the uh, left-sided uh, SVC, thinking was a great idea, and actually uh, tore the left-sided SVC because we didn't realize how much pressure we're putting in there. So, of course, in that case, um, that we, you know, required a balloon to tampon out of the leak and have the surgeon fix it, and the patient did well. Uh, interesting case because, you know, the origin trigger was from the left-sided SVC. As we froze the left-sided SVC, the, the, the FIP terminated and did well. Um, but, of course, putting it in a confined space in retrospect 10 years ago was a bad idea. I, I will share one other case that was very interesting. I think we presented an abstract form at one point. It was a patient with did a long-standing persistent fib ablation with a roof line and um, presented two weeks later with incessant atrial tachycardia. Uh, patient had heart failure, EF 10%. We decided to uh, fail the MEO and cardioversions. We decided to take the patient back because it was such a mathematical atrial arrhythmia, thinking it was atrial flutter. But it was simply a atrial tachycardia from the left atrial roof because patient just had access. Uh, we, I simply took a uh, ablation catheter up without a transeptal sheath. I just snuck across the transeptal site 
put a contact sensing catheter right at the uh, roof, just map with my ablator, ablated and terminated. The force was never over 20. The patient perforated. This was a uh, post crowd balloon. So this was uh, just an anterior to the site where we did a roof line for the crowd balloon. And there's also where the, in retrospect, the tissue is the most friable, uh, just about two weeks post ablation. So the patient, uh, of course, uh, you know, we have pericardial drain in, we take the patient to the operating room. And then uh, the, I thought it was all good. The surgeon called me up to say, you got to take a look at this because every stitch he took just tore, right? So when we create the crowd balloon lesion, it's a very large area. And even to the surgeon's surprise, the tissue didn't look that friable, but every small needle he took in there basically tore through right through because it was so delicate. And that explains why my ablation catheter went right through. So I'll never take another early repeat ablation, <laughs> but that guy was hemodynamically so unstable. I thought it was a good idea. Uh, but I, I think that's a good lesson in terms of how friable the tissue is when you have a large area of modifications with a crowd balloon. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's a good learning point for me. But I think the, uh, you know, the, the, in that case actually needed a pericardial patch. You know, so, but I think this is something that, um, yeah, I think yeah, first to no harm, as I said from the very beginning in anything we do. And it's very easy to take the crowd balloon extra PV to take a large area out of the way. Hopefully we have better mapping or better logics to only target the area that need to be ablated. Thank you. So uh, since the, the uh, time is uh, over, so uh, I think we can let me invite Dr. Shimizu to conclude the, 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 uh, uh, this morning session. So Dr. Uh, are you there? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for all of their speakers so for exciting the uh, four lectures and their uh, case presentation. So uh, this seminar uh, uh, was uh, helpful to uh, their physicians. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for your great contribution. Okay, so thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.